Hi, my name is AJ Hong from We Learn to Share. And today's topic, as you can see, is hormones in the endocrine system. So to be exact, this isn't included in the AP Biology coursework or the AP Biology exam anymore, but it can definitely help you enjoy biology. And I thought it could be a good intro video. So let's get started. So what is a hormone? A hormone is a chemical signal, is a chemical signal utilized by the endocrine system. An endocrine system maintains and initiates bodily functions. Hormones travel through the bloodstream to send signals to other parts to the parts of the body. It works only on a specific cell, which are called target cells. And these target cells are determined by the presence of receptors. Um, it is helpful to compare and contrast the endocrine system and the nervous system. There are, some of the, there are some differences between speed or how it's transmitted. So speed, in terms of speed, the signaling process, uh, the nervous system is much quicker than the endocrine system. And this is because the signal is transmitted uh, via electrical signal instead of a uh, hormone that, that tra tra travels through the bloodstream. And the difference is though that effect lasts longer. Our home, uh, the effects of hormones last longer than the, uh, than the nervous systems. So this is the three stages of hormone signaling. If you're familiar with the basic sing signal transduction, this is essentially the same thing. First, reception is a process of a signaling molecule, in this case, hormone binding to an appropriate receptor. Second, transduction is where the signal is relayed and amplified by the intracellular enzymes. Third, response is a cellular response that res results from the process. For instance, increased respiration rates. Okay, so there are two different um, categories of hormones, and one of them is water soluble, and the other is lipid soluble. So, water soluble hormones cannot enter the phospholipid bilayer through simple diffusion. As you can see on the right hand here, um, there is the structure in the diagram of the phospholipid bilayer that constitutes our membranes and the cell's membranes. And in the phospholipid bilayer, the in inner part is hydrophobic, which means that water soluble or hydrophilic compounds or hormones cannot pass through uh, the membrane through simple diffusion. Thus, for water soluble hormones, the receptor that lies in the cell membrane must receive the signal and amplify it into the cytoplasm, cytoplasm in order to have an appropriate cellular response. Uh, on the other hand, lipid soluble hormones can passively diffuse through the phospholipid bilayer and act on a receptor to form a hormone receptor complex that attaches to DNA and regulates transcription. Next, we're going to talk about important hormones and where they are released from. So in the hypothalamus, we're gonna talk about hypothalamus first. And hypothalamus receives signals and acts appropriately through either sending out nervous or endocrine signals. Directly, um, it directly controls the pituitary gland. And in fact, posterior pituitary is actually connected to the hypothalamus almost as an extension. Um, so hypothalamus is basically the main control center that controls the whole function and regulates the body. So, and, and it maintains and works to maintain homeostasis. And as with all other hormones, it serves to maintain homeostasis, but it's important that it's the master of homeostasis. And in the hypothalamus, it controls most other hormones. There are two pituitary glands, posterior and anterior. And the posterior pituitary gland produces oxytocin, which causes uterine muscles to contract during childbirth in a positive feedback loop to help in the process of the childbirth. And oxytocin, as you may already know, same as for it, it being released during when you're happy, when you're feeling happiness. Um, and the other hormone released from posterior pituitary gland is an antitheritic hormone or ADH that helps the kidney reabsorb water instead of excre excreting all of it through urine. And in the anterior pituitary gland, 
it mainly produces releasing hormones and inhibiting hormones. And these releasing hormones stimulate secretion of certain hormone and inhibiting hormones, as you may tell from its name, it inhibits the secretion of a certain hormone. One good example is the thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH that stimulates the thyroid gland to produce the thyroid. Another example is the growth hormone, GH, that produces development. So too much growth hormone would lead to gigantism and too little GH would lead to dwarfism. So it would be necessary, especially when you're a teen, to have adequate and appropriate amounts of D, uh, GH so that you wouldn't develop either gigantism nor dwarfism. Um, prolactin is a hormone produced by the anterior pituitary gland and is not a releasing hormone nor an inhibiting hormone. It stimulates milk production in mammals. Next up is the thyroid gland. And the thyroid gland, obviously, there's a thyroid hormone. And thyroid hormone increases the rate of metabolism and thus the oxygen consumption rate of the body. Hyperthyroidism. An excess of this thyroid hormone can make a person to sweat a lot, increase blood pressure, and overheat. Hypothyroidism, on the other hand, can lead to intolerance to cold. So thyroid hormones are regulated via a negative feedback loop. And these thyroid hormones inhibit the production of TRH and TSH that eventually produces the thyroid hormones themselves. So when thyroid hormones are produced, they go back and they, they themselves inhibit the production of TRH and TSH that eventually would lead to, um, the, these TRH and TSH would have um, led to production of T, uh, thyroid hormones, but these thyroid hormones themselves, they regulate them, uh, the production. So however, a problem arises when our body is iodine deficient. Why would iodine matter? Well, iodine is essential to produce this hormone thyroid and iodine is needed. So without it, it won't be able to be produced. The thyroid hormone won't be produced. So low thyroid concentration will stimulate the thyroid gland, obviously because the body detects that it's lacking the thyroid hormone within the system. And then it will make the TRH and TSH which, to stimulate uh, the thyroid gland to produce thyroid, but it won't have iodine and it, it won't be able to produce thyroid as the body would tell them, tell it to. And then it's, it's the thyroid gland will be stimulated constantly and it will eventually cause goiter. It's a condition, which is a condition that enlargement of the thyroid caused by repeated stimulation. Next up, pancreas. Pancreas produce insulin and glucagon each decreasing and increasing the level of glucose in the bloodstream. Since their effects are directly opposite, they are said to be antagonistic hormones. So each hormone works to um, kind of um, overrule the, uh, the effect of the other hormone. So they go directly uh, opposite way. Since their effects are directly opposite, they are said to be antagonistic hormones, as I said before. And each hormone works with a negative feedback loop to either store glucose as glycogen, break down to increase concentration. Diabetes is a disorder that makes it unstable to control the blood sugar level. And type 1 is caused by insufficient insulin produ production by beta cells. And type 2 is caused by a problem in the receptor and the transduction of the signal in the target cell. There are two adrenal glands on top of each kidney. In each, in, each, in each of the adrenal glands, there are, there are different portions that produce different hormones, right? So a portion called adrenal medulla produces epinephr epinephrine and nor norepinephrine in response to stress or so-called fight or flight response. These hormones raise blood pressure, breathing, and metabolic rate. And our adrenal cortex, uh, the other portion, becomes activated in a stressful homeostasis condition. Corticosteroids are also produced. Um, 
and they maintain salt and water balance and increase glucose level by synthesizing from lipids and proteins. Gonads, right? So gonads are sex glands. So for males, they are testicles, and for females, they are ovaries. They produce, gonads produce estrogens, progesterone, and androgens. So one of the, one of the key misconceptions, one of the most popular misconceptions, should I say, would be that, for example, in a male, male gonad, so in a testicle, it, the testicle won't produce uh, estrogens, right? And, and for the female ovary, they won't produce the test testosterone. Right, so this is a misconception because the key difference is in the proportion of the hormones release, which leads to the development of, of male or female uh, bodily uh, functions and its development, right? So basically to, to go back to the, to go back to talk about uh, estrogens, progesterone and androgens, and estrogen is related to female reproductive system and female features, as you may already know. And while androgen is related uh, to male reproductive system and male features, so testosterone would be in the category of androgen. And progesterone, the other hormone of the three, the remaining one, prepares preparing of the baby and maintaining the uterus to support an embryo. And that's it. I hope you enjoyed it. And be sure to leave a like, subscribe, and leave a comment down below. And I hope I could see you next time. Right. Bye-bye.